Acts 15. <laughs> We're going to go through the whole chapter. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we are. Beginning at verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through, the, through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so whenever the Lord is moving, let's make this just the introductory thought, kind of a foundational thought. Whenever the Lord is moving, the enemy has a tendency of trying to undermine of the things that God is doing. We know that by experience, but the bottom line is that's just biblically true. When God is moving, the enemy attempts to checkmate that. He attempts to stop the work of the Lord. And God is moving. God is moving through the, the gospel of grace, the message of grace. And so seeing that God is moving through the message of grace, it just is inevitable that there will be an opponent, somebody who is raised up who's going to be trying to bring you into bondage because grace is the unmerited favor of God that releases us from the bondage that we at one time had suffered in our religious disciplines that we were raised in. And so that's what's taking place here. The enemy is starting to raise up opposition. When you look in your Bible, you, you'll, you'll see from the early days of the church that self-appointed teachers very, very often came in order to undermine the truth of the gospel. Um, there's always been a, a way of knowing uh, which was the, the proper message. There's always been that way because um, all you need to do is see what the message is to see whether it lines up with the messages that we've received in that day would have been through the apostles today, whether it lines up with scripture. Because whenever somebody would come and would bring a message, it had to line up with the things that had been previously taught by the apostles. When we began the book of Acts, we noted that the mark of the early church was that they were taught the same message. And that was what was called the word of his grace that they had received through apostolic teaching. So it was the message of the grace of God that the early church held fast to. And it was clearly presented to them through the teaching that came through the apostles. Uh, it was the foundation, again, of all of their beliefs. Remember in Acts, in chapter 2, in verse 42, how it simply said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so initially, you were built on the foundation of the teaching of the apostles, which today is referred to in a theological way as apostolic doctrine. It's just foundational teachings that we received from those who followed Christ as the apostles. And the early church devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. So it is proper to preserve and present the message that reveals the grace of God because it's the message of grace that enables a sinner to be set free from bondage. And Paul made sure that he remained faithful to the true presentation of this message. And later on in chapter 20 in the book of Acts in verse 24, uh, he makes it clear that his desire is to finish his race with joy and he said, and the ministry which he received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Oh, so guarding the message is one of the ways that a true teacher is distinguished from the false because the true teacher values the message and endeavors to properly preserve and present it. So Paul is speaking concerning the presentation of the gospel. And when you see the writings of Paul, you'll see how he spoke concerning it. For example, in 1 Timothy 1, verse 11, he speaks of the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was, he said, committed to my trust. In 1 Timothy 6, 20, he said, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. 
In 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, he said, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And so from the beginning, not only did they have apostolic doctrine, but the teaching of the apostles was guarded. It was preserved because it's the truth that sets a person free. But what you have here in chapter 15 is men coming from Judea who are self-appointed and they're not recognized as teachers. They didn't meet with the approval of the leaders of the church. As a matter of fact, when you look at verse 24, getting ahead of myself for a moment, it says there, since we heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law. Notice, to whom we gave no such commandment. So these are self-appointed teachers going out, trying to improve on the gospel of grace, and they're going to be rebuked for doing so. We need to remember that Paul and Barnabas went out to minister under the authority of the church. Remember in Acts 13, how that the Spirit gave directions to the church leadership. It says in Acts 13, 2 and 3, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then having fasted and prayed, laid hands on them, they sent them away. So there was a proper way for the message of the gospel to be communicated to people. It was the gospel that had apostolic authority and there was leadership that actually laid hands on, prayed, and by the Spirit's guidance would send people out to preach this message. These people who are coming in chapter 15 are not of that stripe. They are not sent out. They're coming out on their own. They came without authorization, and as they came, they brought error. Now, over the history of the church, the church eventually had to be taught to be discerning because more and more false teachers began to arise. In 2 John, verse 7, it says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver, he says, and an antichrist. In 2 John 10, if someone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite him into your house or encourage him in any way. False teachers were already entering in and undermining the gospel. So Paul spoke about this because he was concerned about the attack that was coming upon the gospel. He didn't encourage people to tolerate error, by the way. He encouraged people to avoid it. That, by the way, is a message in and of itself today because there are quite a number of, of very sweet and simple, uh, very innocently naive believers who will pretty much believe anything that's, that's said. But Paul never taught, Jesus never taught, no biblical writer ever taught that we should just accept everything because somebody says it's true. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, Paul said, I, I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters, Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things that are contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. And so early in the history of the church, there were self-appointed teachers who went out bringing a message that originated in their own opinions. So in this passage, the self-appointed legalists have arrived to correct the church. They came without authorization, and they gave their own opinions. Again, this happens today, and you see this especially with internet teachers who are always out there straightening somebody's problem. You see it all the time. I don't know if you have Facebook, but uh, there are quite a number of internet theologians, and uh, I've had more than one conversation with them who are correcting me. You know, and um, it's and I say, Rawl, please don't do that. If you, <laughs> you got my phone number, just call me. But that happens quite often today. Now these men are unnamed, so it's difficult to know exactly who they are. But one thing is known: they've exceeded the message of the gospel because they've added to it. They've exceeded it because they've added to it. We need to remember that God's word is to be communicated without addition or omission. In De Deuteronomy 12, 32, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, 
nor take away from it. So our responsibility is the communication of the Word of God without adding and without omitting. And so from its early history, the message of the gospel began to be changed. One of the more important New Testament books that you could spend time reading is Galatians. In the book of Galatians, Paul was dealing with infiltrators. They were called Judaizers who were bringing in a mixture of law and grace, and they were creating what would be called a hybrid message, and they were taking the power from the gospel, and they were actually causing that power to be quenched because they were bringing the people into bondage. Paul was greatly concerned about that. When you read the book of Galatians, you'll notice in the introduction in chapter 1 how he wrote in verses 6 through 9. He said, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And so these who were called the Judaizers are basically sharing the same kind of things that the Galatians had heard. And so in Galatians 2, in verses 4 and 5, Paul said, This occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. How do you deal with error? You don't allow it to proceed. You deal with it. It has to be confronted, and it has to be corrected. Now, they were insisting on circumcision, that circumcision was necessary for salvation. They were also saying that you needed to be under what was called the law of Moses. Their, uh, their, their belief was that if you don't understand the yoke of the law, then you'll never understand the depth of grace. And so what they were saying is you need to be circumcised and you need to follow the law of Moses, which was bringing people into bondage. So they were trying to improve the gospel of Jesus and destroying grace at the same time. You see, by adding to the gospel of grace, you create a different kind of message. We need to remember that it's by grace that we've been saved, and it isn't by our works in Romans 3.24, it says we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Somebody said the teaching that salvation is by human works is the foundation of all false religions and the longest running heresy in the history of the Christian church. That's true. Some people cannot handle how God can be so gracious to you. I've said this so many times, it always comes to mind, forgive me for repeating myself, but it happened when I first got saved. I began to encounter legalism and all, and I was reading an article about the church. At that time, the church that was best known, it was a very large church in another state, it had many thousands of people. And I've said this to you before, some of you will remember how that that was a time when hippies were getting saved. And anybody who remembers ancient history knows that hippies had long hair and didn't wear shoes and wouldn't go to church. But some began going to church. And in this other state, hippies began to go into this particular church. And so the pastor was evangelistic. He would give an invitation. And then the person who wanted to receive Christ would come forward. They would pray with them. Then they would send them back for counseling like we do here, with the exception that if you were a hippie, you had your long hair, but you also had a barber on staff. So when you went into the back and were counseled, you were ushered into another room to get your hair cut off too, because everybody knows that Jesus wore a flat top. Everybody knows that. And so that's what was taking place. And that, by the way, a brief ancient history, um, was why when Pastor Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, um, Costa Mesa, why Pastor Chuck had such an impact on young people's lives. Because he didn't lay a heavy burden on our shoulders. He didn't tell us to start wearing shoes when we went to church. 
I didn't wear shoes to church, you know, at, at California. I didn't wear shoes anywhere. I, I, I would wear slacks and a dress shirt, and I'd still be barefooted. I, to this day, don't wear shoes around my house. I never, I'm just, I'm, I just don't. I, when I started this church, and I was doing Sunday morning Bible studies, I, would, I had my flip-flops. I used to call them thongs, but I don't call them that anymore. <laughs> So they're flip-flops. And I would kick them off. And I would just cross my bare feet. And I sat on a, on a, couch, on a, a little chair. And it was my mom who told me, you've got to start wearing shoes. I don't like looking at your feet. That was my mom. Be because I, because I, I have these traces of hippieism that are still in me to this day. And so I thank God for men like Pastor Chuck, who didn't tell kids like me, I was 20, kids like me, you're not welcome here. You've got to do these things in order to be right with God. Everybody knows you should have short hair. Everybody knows. Listen, the, the church has always gone through these times of legalism because we have a tendency of wanting to make people look good on the outside. We have that tendency. We think if you look like what we think a Christian ought to look like, then you must be a good person. And that's just not true. There are guys, you know, who are tattooed from, their, from the tips of their fingers through their body, and, 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 and people say, you can't possibly be saved. But sometimes these guys with these tattoos and all of that, and these young women with their tattoos, they, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something you'll think about when you're 60. You'll say, why did they do this? But when you're young, you know what? There are young people who will relate to them. I don't have a problem with it. The Bible doesn't forbid it. We have to be very careful with our attitudes. You know, the, the kids with the piercings and, and things like that. Yeah, sometimes I look at them and I say to myself, oh my, your, dad, your daddy must be very proud. I mean, I, I look sometimes <laughs> and I say, wow, 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 wow. But you know, man looks on the outer, but God looks at the heart. And we have to be very careful that we don't lay legalistic trips on people, burdens on people, because you're just moving into quenching the Holy Spirit's work in that person's life. You really are. And so that's what's taking place here. With them, not that they were wearing tats and had markings of, on their foreheads or anything like that, but they were beginning to get upset saying, listen, if you're going to really be saved, you need to you know, you male Gentiles who have been brought in to the, uh, to the faith, you need to receive circumcision, and all of you are now to be under the law. And so what happens? Well, notice verse 2, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, that was a heated argument. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders, about this question. So, being sent on the way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. They caused great joy to all the brethren. And so, as is true with legalists, these false brethren dogmatically insisted that they were right. And Paul felt that they needed to simply get along and encourage them in their teaching. After all, who was he to judge their hearts, right? No, that's not how it went. As long as they mention Jesus in their teachings, it's still okay? No. Instead, he vehemently disagreed and would not give ground for a moment. He didn't say it's okay, you're saying Jesus. No. He said this is wrong. Why? Because he knew that this would destroy the message of the gospel. He knew it would bring people into bondage, and he argued against it vehemently. So what happens? Verse 3, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, etc. As they're doing so and making their way to Jerusalem, they're giving reports of the work of God, and the people are hearing this, and there's great joy that's being experienced. And finally, in verse 4, they had come to Jerusalem. They were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, they reported all things that God had done with them, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed 
rose up saying, it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so you're going to have, you know, some more disputation taking place. Now, in verse 4, I'll just point one thing out and then move on. Notice again, they came to Jerusalem and were received by the church, apostles, and elders. That gives you an insight into the life of the church and the authority of the church. You had the apostles, you had elders, and you had the congregation that's being spoken of here. And as this is taking place and they're sharing, verse 5, the Pharisees who believe said, it's necessary for these things. You need to be under the law, etc. Now, unlike Paul, who, remember, was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, unlike Paul, these Pharisees had not relinquished their Mosaic traditions. They believed in the resurrection. They also believed that Jesus is Messiah. But they were ingrained with traditions. And when you're ingrained with traditions, it's really not always that easy to let go of them. Some religious traditions are not easy to unlearn. Have you discovered that? Some are not easy to unlearn. It depends, of course, on your devotion and your religious background. But I've discovered that some religious traditions are not easy to unlearn. When, uh, oh, I've shared this again. This is another old story, but it always comes to mind. Religious traditions and letting them go. Marie, and I, Marie got saved. My wife got saved in my Bible study. My sister Madeline brought Marie to faith in Christ um, probably within two or three weeks of her coming to her first Bible study that she'd ever really gone to to hear the gospel preached. She came to my Bible study. My brother invited her. I was discipling my brother at that time in the city of Ontario back in 1974. And uh, Marie showed up. Within two, three weeks or so, she gave her heart to Christ. And she needed discipling, and I started dating her. And as we were going out, <laughs> just making sure she walked straight with the Lord. <laughs> We'd been going out for several months, several months, several months. I wasn't somebody who told her, you need to do these things. If you don't do these things, I did want her to memorize scripture. We had our problems about that. But in terms of just, you got to do these things or else, I, I'm not, I was not that way, even as a boyfriend. You know, and so I was taking her out, and it, we'd been going out for months, and we were driving. We were in Anaheim, and we happened to drive by. We're on the 5 freeway driving, and off to, out, right off the freeway was some kind of dance club of some sort. And Marie is seated next to me, and she looks at me, and she goes, oh, I was there last night. I said, oh. What were you doing there? She said, oh, I went dancing with my girlfriends, and I went dancing. I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. And uh, she said, a guy really took an interest in me. Now we're driving. And she says, the guy really took an interest in me. He asked for my phone number. I said, really? She goes, yeah. I said, did you give it to him? She says, no. Why not? Well, I told him my boyfriend wouldn't like it. And I looked at her. I said, you got a boyfriend? <laughs> I was serious. I, I was serious. You got a boyfriend? She goes, yes, I do. I said, who? Who? She said, you. And I said, I'm not your boyfriend. She goes, what? I'm not your boyfriend. What do you mean by that? I said, listen, if I were your boyfriend, you wouldn't have been there last night. She never went again. <laughs> I did. No, she didn't. <laughs> I don't, I'm not into that, you know, oh, you, no, listen, I, I, this is so practical. It really is, if you get past the stupidity of it. It's very practical. Um, I can't force my girlfriend to love me. She chooses to or she doesn't. 
based on what she wants to do. Who am I to tell her who to like and not to like? She makes choices, right? I could not make her into a saint by telling her, memorize these scriptures, pray this often, go to church this often, do these things. That just creates a very self-righteous, rigid legalist. That's what it creates. But when you fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what you do? You read his word. You pray. You fellowship with other people who love Jesus Christ. You go to church. You serve God. Why? Because you're in love with him. It's not that tough. You know, so many times, I don't know what to do. Well, I don't know what to do. You know what? When you begin to just enjoy the Lord in his presence and you walk in his grace, his commandments are not burdensome. They're not. They're the joy of your heart. They're the delight of your heart, as the psalmist would say, because your delight is just being with him and pleasing him. It's, it's that simple. And here come the, the Judaizer. Here come the, the legalists who are saying, oh, no, 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 Paul, no. Uh, no, it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. That is the legalism of it. And so they say, no, it is necessary. So there are some things, some religious traditions that aren't easy to unlearn. There are things that you bring into your walk with the Lord. But as you get into the word of God, you discover these things are no longer going to have their hold on you. And so this is what is taking place. Verse 6, the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. So there's a private meeting between the leaders of the church. It's the leaders and not the congregation who are to make a ruling on this divisive issue. Verse 7, when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So Peter stands up and simply reminds them of how that some commentators say 10 years, others say as many as 17 years earlier at the house of Cornelius. You remember the story in Acts 10, how that Peter had spoken to these Gentiles, the Holy Spirit had fallen upon them. They were brought into the body of Christ as believers, and that's what he's alluding to. He's saying God has already and done this a long while ago brought them into the knowledge of the grace of God. And remember with me, notice verse 8, how it says, God knows the heart, acknowledge them by giving them the Holy Spirit. Remember with me that, that it was while yet Peter spoke these words, that the Spirit came upon those who were listening. So they never made a confession of faith, but God knew their heart that they had faith to receive, and that's why they received the, the uh, regeneration and power of the Holy Spirit that had taken place. And so he's reminding them of what had taken place. And then he says this in verse 10, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the neck of these disciples? Why are you doing that? Why are you putting a yoke of them? Now, the word yoke speaks of what has been called the severity of the law. The severity of keeping the whole law is what he's referring to. You see, in James, in chapter 2, verse 10, it speaks of the severity of the law in this way. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. That's severe. You know, you have 613 commandments in the Old Testament. You could keep 612, though it's not possible, but say you did and break one, you're guilty of them all. And that's what James was saying. Matthew 23, verse 4, Jesus speaking concerning legalism and all, said they tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders. They themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. The heavy loads is, once again, their commandments, their ordinances, their rules, their regulations. He says, then they load them with these things. That's why in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus would say, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. 
You cannot carry that yoke. And that's why Peter is saying, why do you want to put the yoke of bondage on them, a yoke that we nor our fathers were able to bear? Why would you do that? He says in verse 11, we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. If we are saved by grace, why are you arguing that they'll be saved by law? Now, as he's speaking, verse 12, all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So he's speaking about how God had poured out his spirit and God had done work and he'd done so amongst the Gentiles. And they're listening to this as they're giving their report. And after all this has taken place, verse 13, they became silent. James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things, known to God from eternity are all his works. So James, who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem and, and very highly regarded and tremendously respected, begins to speak. This James is the brother of Jesus. He's the leading elder of the church there in Jerusalem. And so being Jesus' half-brother, he naturally had tremendous respect of all who were present. And he summarizes what has been said because he's about to make a, a judgment. He speaks in verse 14 of Simon. I find that interesting because he refers to Peter by his old name. And that's a way of establishing his longevity, his, his, uh, his credentials, if you will. And he speaks concerning how God visited the Gentiles. So what he does is he begins to speak, to, speak of the ministry uh, that Simon had to Cornelius. And he's pointing out that, that God had, by his grace, already begun saving Gentiles. To emphasize that, notice he roughly quotes from the book of Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. When you look at that passage there, found in verses 16 and 17 here, when you look at that passage in Amos, it speaks of what has been called the millennial, uh, the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom that will be set up by Messiah. But its point is that the kingdom will be populated by all who have come to God, both Jew and Gentile. So he's saying Gentiles will be there. They don't have to become Jews. And since that's true, there's no need for Gentiles to become converted to Judaism today. So James sees the prophecy fulfilled. And he says, no, that, that took place when Jesus was resurrected and he made the two one. Well, as he's speaking, he now makes a judgment. Verse 19, therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So it's interesting how he, he begins to bring this judgment. Um, He's making it very clear here that Jewish believers are not to trouble the Gentiles. It's interesting. I, when I saw that word in verse 19, I judged uh, that we should not trouble those. That word trouble, I thought, now what does that mean? And I found it interesting. The original language simply means to annoy. They shouldn't be annoying them is the thing he's saying. It's interesting to me. But it's what he's saying. Don't be annoying your Gentile brethren. What he's going to do here, by the way, is he's going to give us something very practical because this deals with both cultural and religious sensitivities. Sensitivity to religious traditions should produce consideration. You see, Gentiles will show a spirit of unity by voluntarily doing four things or some basic things. One, they're to reject idolatry. 
Now, rejecting idolatry is represented by avoiding the food that is offered to idols. And they're speaking concerning this when it says um, abstain from things polluted by idols. Uh, during that day, you would go into a marketplace, which we, we still have marketplaces, open markets to this day, but you'd go to a marketplace. And very often, there was uh, a stand that sold meat that was basically under the ownership, if you will, of the local pagan temple. And so I, as a Gentile, could walk in there and purchase the meat, which, you know, would be a good cut of meat because they would sell certain meats that were being offered to idols. But it would cause people who knew that that meat had been offered to idols before being sold in what were called the shambles, it would cause them to be stumbled. The Jews especially had a sensitivity, though Gentiles did too, to this. And so he's saying, you need to be abstaining from these things because there's a religious as well as cultural sensitivity to them. Because the Bible teaches from the very beginning that idolatry is forbidden. There is one God, and you're to worship him alone. And so you need to abstain from anything that in any way smells like idolatry. And so to reject idolatry is represented as avoiding the food that had been offered to the idols. So be sensitive, he's saying, to the tenderness of other people's consciences. Remember that idolatry in the Old Testament had led to the judgment of the Jewish nation. And so naturally, they're very sensitive about that. And thus, as a Gentile, you need to abstain from these kinds of things so that you don't wound the sensitive conscience of your Jewish brethren. You see, it is more loving to a brother or a sister when you are tender to their consciences. Let me say this real briefly and I'll move on. Christians today, sometimes we need to be re reminded of that because one of the things that I have heard frequently uh, in recent years, it's been going on for many years, of course, but recent years has been, hey, if you have a problem with that, that's your problem, not mine. There are a lot of people like that. You know, if you, if you say, you know, I have to be honest with you, that, 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 that stumbles me. And what is the response? Is it like, you know, I'm sorry, I apologize, I, I didn't intend to do that. Is that what they do? No, very often, no, that's not at all. What they'll say is, hey, get over it. That's your problem, not mine. I'm not in bondage to you. Why would, and there's this attitude that my freedoms override your conscience. That's not the love of God. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. If something you feel free to do stumbles a brother, why would you stumble your brother? Why would you do that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 10 through 12, you see this is what can happen. We Christians who think it is wrong to eat this food will see you eating in the temple of an idol. You know there's nothing wrong with it, but they will be encouraged to violate their own conscience by eating food that has been dedicated to the idol. So because of your superior knowledge, a weak Christian for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And you are sinning against Christ when you sin against other Christians by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong. We have to be sensitive to one another's scruples and concerns. So one, he says, be sensitive to the tenderness of other people's consciences. Two, he speaks of sexual immorality. We need to remember, during that day especially, but you still see it today, orgies were associated with idolatry. And we say, well, here in the United States, we don't have that. Um, yeah, we do. In, in New Orleans, you know, you have Mardi Gras, and it is sexual orgies. And it, to this day, continues in one form or another. But he says that they're to abstain from sexual immorality. So in matters of sexual conduct, Gentiles are to do nothing that violates God's law or Jewish moral scruples. Again, be sensitive to your relationships. He goes on to speak about meat that has been strangled. That speaks of dietary law. Now, you were to avoid the blood 
that, that came even before the law was given. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, it speaks concerning not eating the flesh with blood in it. But you also see it in Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17 and other passages. Again, Gentiles aren't under the law, but they are sensitive to those who have been. Listen, if uh, I, I just try and be real practical. Um, if, if, you, if you were sharing the gospel with a person who is a Jewish, of a Jewish background, right? And, and you share the passages that reveal that Jesus is the Messiah. And that Jewish person hears the message of the gospel and comes to faith in Christ and prays with you and says, you know what? I, I need my Messiah. He came for me. And there's a sincere response to the gospel. And you know they came to faith in Christ, and this is an Orthodox Jew who all their lives had been under the law, and now they're free by the grace of God. You don't take them out for ham and eggs. <laughs> you, you just don't. You don't hand them a pork chop. You're free in Christ. No, you don't do that. It's just so practical. We just don't stumble a brother or a sister. You don't have to do that. Be careful not to. You see, what this is really doing, and this is really the point, is it's smoothing a path for Gentiles to eat in fellowship with the Jews. It made them aware of the tenderness of the conscience of a Jewish person, and that's the point he's making. And so, in verse 22, it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own country to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they wrote this letter by them, the apostles and elders and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. And so it pleases the apostles, pleases the elders, pleases the whole church. And they send out these people who were chosen. You see, that was done because the Judaizers would have said that Paul and Barnabas were making up this judgment. So they had a letter, they had chosen men, they had the council's approval that gave validation to what they were saying. In verse 24, it says, since we have heard that some, of, some, who, uh, some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. So once again, these were unauthorized church members bringing their own opinions. The result is the removal of the peace and unity of the spirit. He goes in verse 25, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas who will also report the same things by word of mouth for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. Very simple, very simple letter. So it seems good to us. Once again, it's giving credibility because these are the chosen men. These are sacrificial servants of, of God. And it seems good to us. Not only does this seem good to us, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. So that emphasizes the importance of the leading of the Spirit in the life of the church as it went and brought this particular message to their brethren. So, verse 30, when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now, Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted, this, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And so the news that they received brought them great relief great joy, and great encouragement. And so, as this is taking place, verses 34 and 35, Silas, Paul, and Barnabas remain for a time in order that they might minister, and that's what they're doing. And they stayed there for some time 
doing just that. But notice verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. See how they're doing. Barnabas was determined to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take, they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Contention. We'll talk about this for a couple of minutes as we close. Paul was not willing to take an immature believer out on ministry. When he had originally had Mark with him, the ministry proved to be too, too difficult for him, apparently, because he departed and went home. Paul didn't forget that. Now, you need to remember that Barnabas' name literally means son of encouragement. And he had a gift of encouragement. Barnabas was quite obviously the kind of guy who said, I believe in giving more opportunities. And because he failed doesn't mean he's a failure. Barnabas, on the other, uh, Paul, on the other hand, is saying, no, wait a minute. It's not that he's you know, quote unquote, a failure, is that he's not mature enough to handle the load of ministry that we're going through. And I believe that both of these men had, had, had great points. And that you, if you looked at each argument that they were having, and it, it was very heavy, by the way, it wasn't a light conversation. The word contention is, is a word that speaks concerning something very bitter. It, it's, it's a very strong contention. It's not just a mild disagreement. Um, you know, I think I'd like to have a Dr. Pepper. No, I think you ought to have a root beer. No, I think I've, that's a mild disagreement. I'll have both. Um, it's just a mild disagreement. No, this is something that is a very emotionally intense, intense thing. It, is, it would be very uncomfortable for you to be in the presence of it. Have you ever been in? I know you have. Been in a room where two people are going at it, and you're kind of like, I want out of this room. I don't need to be part of this. These people are too angry. It was like that. We're going to take him with us. No, you're not. He departed from us. Yeah, but you've got to give him an opportunity. Listen, Paul, you forget who you are. You remember how, and he could remind him. Barnabas could remind him. You remember how nobody wanted to receive you, and I put my arm around your shoulder, and I said, he's okay. He's all right. He's with me. Do you remember that? Hey, those were, that was years ago. I've already proved myself. I appreciated it then, but this is a different thing. You can hear the argument. He abandoned us in ministry. We will not bring him with us because what if we encounter difficulty again and he leaves us once more? I believe you need to give him another opportunity. Just because he failed once doesn't mean he'll fail every time. We all learn from our failures. We all learn what it means to be a success. God's grace is sufficient. Haven't we been arguing about grace all this time? And now you are giving him, what, the law? That's how it was going. So what did they do? They said, you know, you're right. No. He said, I'm taking off with this guy. You can go with that one. And that's how it ended up. <sighs> They were strong in their beliefs. It wasn't some carnal argument calling each other out. They were strong in their beliefs. Somebody said it like this. John Mark had been tried in trying circumstances, and he failed. Paul, therefore, would not trust him again. The affection of Barnabas led him to hope the best and was therefore desirous to give him another chance. Barnabas would not give up. Paul would not agree. They therefore agreed to depart from one another and take different parts of the work. Each had an attendant and companion at hand. So Barnabas took John Mark, sailed to Cyprus. Paul took Silas. He went into Syria. And in verse 41, he went through Syria, Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Instead of a single team, 
you now have two ministry teams. But let's close with grace. I thank God that we have a New Testament because we can read and see how things ended up. Because the last letter that Paul ever wrote is 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says this at verse 11. The last letter he ever wrote when he's just about to conclude his letter, 2 Timothy, he says, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he's very helpful to me. Listen, it isn't always how you begin, it's how you finish. Don't forget that. Who in this room has lived a spotlessly perfect, successful Christian life every step of the way? The answer, obviously, is none of us. None of us. Does that give an excuse for failure? No. But when you fail and you learn, you can mature and grow. When you fail, which you will, and you learn, you can mature and not repeat that, that, that error, that sin again. That's a fact. I, I, I'll close with these thoughts. I am so grateful for the God of the second chance. But he's not just the God of the second chance. He's the God of the third chance and the fourth chance and the fifth chance and the sixth chance. He is the God of grace. And when I have failed, and I have, and when I've failed miserably, and I have, my God has always been there to lift me up and make me stand. Because he washes and he cleanses you with the blood of Christ. He strengthens you, and he says to you, in a sense, have you learned your lessons? And you say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Indeed, you are. Have you learned your lesson? I will, Lord, with your strength and your help, I will not go back. I will go forward with you. And God gives you opportunities to do so many things for him. And so it's no excuse to sin. Please don't ever take it as a permission. It isn't, but it certainly is a wonderful thing to have the grace of God extended to you. It isn't by works of my righteousness. It's his grace. You need to remember that.